Good afternoon. My name is Deb Arns and I'm Associate Director for Collections here at the Nebraska State Historical Society and I'd like to welcome you to the Brown Bag Lecture Series which is held here at the Nebraska History Museum the third Thursday of every month. A detailed schedule of this series as well as information about Historical Society activities can be found at our website www.nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speakers, I would like to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming for these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. The Nebraska State Historical Society's collections are vast and include archival and archaeological materials, museum objects, photographs, books, and audio and visual recordings. Today's program is Treasures from the Collections and will feature just a few highlights from the collections as selected by three of our curators, Karen Keir, the Curator of Photographs, Laura Mooney, our Senior Museum Curator, and Paul Eisloffel, the Curator of Audiovisual Collections. So welcome, Karen. Um, so thanks for coming. Uh, I think uh, I had a lot of fun putting together this uh, program. Um, it was actually hard just choosing a few collections to talk about. And I'm timing myself because I will just talk on and on until they actually probably tackle me away. Um, <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk about some of my favorite new collections or um, uh, new collections that I've discovered since becoming the photo curator about four and a half years ago. Um, so today we're going to talk about, uh, the, the first one we're going to talk about is the Nathaniel Duell Collection. And I really want to talk about this one because this is actually a collection that the Historical Society has had for about, um, since about the 1950s after um, <clears throat> Nathaniel the Duell uh, passed away. He was a professional photographer out of Omaha. He actually got his start in photography working um, with the Signal Corps in World War I where he um, took aerial photographs. Um, his love of uh, photography developed from there. But um, one of the reasons why this one collection has come to my attention is because it has been deteriorating rapidly. They are mostly, mostly um, nitrate and uh, acetate negatives, and they deteriorate very rapidly in, in unpredictable ways. And how we stop that deterioration, and you can see this negative here with the skunks has been badly deteriorating. Um, the cracks that you see is actually the channeling of the plastic negatives. It's the plastic shrinking away from the um, emulsion. So to stop, to, do, to stop that and save these amazing photographs, we actually have to freeze them. Um, so right now we're digitizing this collection which has over 5,000 negatives in it. Um, something like, I forget, like uh, 60 or no, 200 boxes. Um, and they're amazing photographs. You can see by this photograph, it's one of my new favorites, and I have a new favorite every single day. But uh, look at the use of his light and shadow and darkness. I mean, he was an amazing photographer. Uh, he took photos in, o in Omaha from the 20s and 30s, 40s and 50s, um, th uh, 40s. Uh, this one, again, you can see the deterioration around the edges. Um, luckily, through scanning and digitization, we're actually able to save that image before um, it's completely deteriorated. So before we freeze them and put them into cold storage, we're making high-resolution digital images in the, our digital imaging lab. Uh, so we have these amazing images all throughout the collection, um, and uh, uh, Duell is actually <coughs> most well known for his images of airplanes and aerial photography around Omaha, um, which I selected none of. <laughs> um, but uh, this is this one. We saw the outside fire, but this is an inside fire of the Millard Hotel in Omaha, and it's one of the few photos I've ever seen of an interior after a fire. Um, and you just you think it's really interesting to see that opulence against the devastation of the fire. Um, uh, so we received the collection after Duell's death in 1954. Um, and some of the images associated with air, aviation and airmail actually went on to the Smithsonian. And the Smithsonian has prizes this, these collections as some of the, of the best images. Oops. Um, that they have in their collection of um, aerial photo of the airmail and um, things, and have actually done exhibits on Duel himself using the collection. 
They're so cute, aren't they? Um, that's Jack Dempsey of uh, it, uh, handing out candy at the Orpheum Theater in Omaha. Um, the collection ranges from everything from cute little kids in dance costumes to um, buildings and houses that are no longer exist in Omaha to this kind of everyday life. Um, so we're really proud to have this collection and it's a very unique and large collection. Um, so we're doing everything we can to preserve it by um, scanning it, digitizing it. You can find uh, a number of the images, something like a thousand images are online right now um, that you can search through and experience more of Dole's collection. <coughs> The next collection that I chose is a newer collection that we just received. And um, this one just has a unique story of how it came to me and how it um, got to the Historical Society. This collection, I had a donor call me and said, I've found these photos. Can you take a look at them? I said, sure, no problem. Bring them in. We'll I'll take a look at them. Well, years ago, he bought a storage unit. He, this was long before Storage Wars on TV. He bought a storage unit. He heard it was a good way to make a few bucks. So he got this storage unit, and it wasn't, nobody else wanted this storage unit. It had kind of been ransacked, and he bought this storage unit. And um, as he was going through it, his wife was going through it with him, and she found this box of photos in the storage unit. And his wife said, you, you have to save these. These are amazing photographs. You have to save these. Take them to the Historical Society and, and see if they want them. But don't throw them away before you talk to the Historical Society. So the donor, he kind of sat on these photographs for about two or three years and then finally brought them to me. And I took one look at these photographs, which are all basically from the 50s and 60s here in Lincoln of this family. Now luckily there was some paperwork with the family photos and like some obituaries and things. So we were able to, I had an intern, do some research on this family. And we were able to identify it as the Frank, um, uh, Frank Williams family here in Lincoln. They had six children, four girls, two boys. Um, you recognize that's the, uh, the buffalo at Pioneer Park. That's the union in at... Uh, UNL. So it's just this really unique aspect. This is Joyce. We believe that Joyce may have been the owner of the, the storage unit. Her name is most likely most on the photographs. Um, and then all of her nieces, all of her nephews, all of her family. I don't know that the family has any idea that I have these photographs and that I consider them one of my prized <laughs> collections. Um, so here's Joyce as a bridesmaid. And I think these women, this whole family are just absolutely gorgeous. They're just living their lives, but they're just, I love that this is a snapshot of look into Lincoln in the 1950s from this African-American perspective. Because who doesn't a cowboy in the 50s, right? <laughs> <laughs> these are some of the grandchildren, um, Lamont, Roger, and Derek Williams, dressed as cowboys. Um, it took a lot of genealogy and a lot of um, looking through ge uh, census records and, and data and reading through newspapers and, and using every available online resource that we could find to piece together this family tree. But my intern did a wonderful job of coming up with all the names and people. I want this coat really badly. <laughs> Not to mention the ma matching pillbox hat. <clears throat> Uh, I just love that they just had this wonderful kind of, you just see their humor in their outgoing life. Um, they've, uh, they were very heavily involved in a church here in Lincoln. Um, the father was actually a dean of the church, and um, they went on to do amazing things from what I can tell. Okay, my last collection, which I'm hoping, I'm trying to watch my timer here. Okay, I'm doing good. My last collection here is another collection that um, we're really proud to have. It's one of my favorite collections. Um, I did have a little problem with trying to choose the images for this collection um, because this whole collection was put together by um, Robert Merchant. He um, was a young man in Wayne, Nebraska who enlisted in the Army um, in World War II. And uh, he was, at the age of 22, became a staff sergeant for the 90th Bond Group, a.k.a. the Jolly Rogers, from 42 to 45. 
The 90th Ground Bomb Group um, operated primarily in the Southwest Pacific. There's Roger, or Robert, sorry, did I say Roger? That's Robert, sitting at his typewriter, writing for the um, U.S. Army magazine. Um, they mostly uh, operated in the South Pacific, Australia and New Guinea. Um, and he took these amazing, oh, this is, um, apparently they would leave messages in parachutes to the, the, the flight people. Apparently they were out of cigarettes and uh, coffee, so. <laughs> um, but his collection is a very extensive collection. He was the, one of the photographers one of the aerial photographers for the bomb group. Um, they were used for, the photographers were used for reconnaissance, mapping um, lo the location of enemy troops and the formation um, and target areas. Uh, he was one of the several photographers of his units. We do presume that Mar uh, Robert took most of these photographs, but there were some trading going on between, for, uh, farm between them. Um, so these are all mostly of uh, B-24 liberators, and I'm sorry if I had that wrong. I'm going to look to Vince and he's going to shake his head yes or no if I'm getting them the right kind of airplanes. Um, but these are amazing. Uh, every of one of the planes would have this kind of bomber art. And, um, oops, wrong notes. They would actually, um, the units would actually try to get the um, artists into their, un their units. They would trade for these artists to come and it would be kind of a competition between the different bomb groups. Now you can see where my problem was, was trying to find um, appropriate okay. photos for this. You want to see more of Robert Merchant's photo photography, especially the bomber art and things. Check out our new website. Um, if you go to our website, nebraskahistory.org, and look under um, virtual exhibits, uh, we just put up a, the in, my intern who organized this collection for me, she also created a website. And we've just put the website up online. So you can actually experience many, many more of Robert's Merchants. You can also go to our searchable online database and find more of Robert's Merchants, even more that, um, photographs um, that are available on here. We were very, very fortunate to get this collection. His, um, after Robert passed, Robert um, went back to Wayne, Nebraska afterwards, became one of the a community leader, ran his uh, father's um, oil business. Or uh, in, uh, After he passed away, his two daughters um, found this trunk. It was a tr trunk that he never really discussed when he was alive. And um, his daughters thought long and hard about what to do with it and where would be the most appropriate place to have this um, deposited. And they chose us. So we are hugely honored and very thankful to his daughters, Paulette and Joni, for graciously donating this collection to us. And um, I hope that you'll go online and experience more of it. Um, but that's my photos. I'm going to turn it over to Laura Mooney next, and she's going to talk to you about treasures from the um, artifact collection. Well, much like Karen, I had trouble just picking a couple of collections to talk to you about today. Um, we have so many great things in our museum collection, so I decided to talk about a couple of new collections that we've just received this past year. And um, <laughs> the first is our Don Pow collection. Um, Luckily, it has both artifact, manuscript, and photo collections, so I'm going to show you a few things from the other parts of the collection as well. Um, but Don Powell was an artist who got his start in Nebraska. He was born in Omaha and attended the University of Nebraska. Um, he was really an illustrator and cartoonist in his early career. While he was at UNL, he was a staffed artist for the annual. And even before he graduated in 1904, he'd already had some cartoons published in the Omaha World Herald. Um, and then into the teens and 20s, he had quite a few political cartoons um, published in the Omaha Bee. Um, he was also active in the Omaha Art Guild, and in 1911, he was one of those who helped found the Art Guild and served as their first president. Then sometime in the 1920s, he moved to New York, and that's where his mask-making career really started and took off. And um, here you can see one photo from the collection showing him in his studio making a mask. 
And here's another one. Uh, here he's making basically the base for the mask. Um, he would start off with plaster of Paris and clay and basically sculpt um, the head of, of the form that he would want to use for his mask making. And here you can see another one uh, making a Shirley Temple mask. And so to form the mask, he would use layers of paper and adhesive, um, sometimes little pieces of fabric, silk, um, to form things like ears, um, noses, <coughs> things like that. And then they were covered in uh, paint and lacquer. He um, made a lot of masks of actors and actresses, including Shirley Temple, which you just saw. And this is Carmen Miranda and Joan Crawford. Um, also politicians, this is Wendell Wilkie, and um, he made quite a few versions of Wendell Wilkie. Um, we have two in the collection that was donated to us, and then we also have received photos of, of the masks uh, and people wearing them, and this one is a little bit different in this photo um, than e either of the masks we have received in our collection. So we know he, uh, he made at least three of the Wendell Wilkie masks. He also did um, animals. Um, so this is the Borden cow, likely for an advertising campaign. And we have a photo of someone wearing that mask. Um, some of the masks were more caricatures, um, not based on real people. Um, sometimes they're made as half masks so that the person wearing them could speak and have their mouth moving. Um, these are half masks. Um, on the bottom you can see waiters that are dressed um, wearing uh, some of Powell's masks. Um, they were made in an uh, 1890s style and above the waiters on the stage you can see Joe Howard performing. He's the one with the top hat. Um, this photo was taken um, in Manhattan at a club called Diamond Horseshoe and um, Apparently, Joe Howard also had a radio show around that time and a TV show. Um, and so the masks were made in the 1890s style to go along with that performance. Here's a great ad for Kellogg's Albrand. Um, you can see he's illustrating this woman's plight with constipation. <laughs> he did a lot of advertising campaigns, um, but the masks were also used in theater productions, social events, movies, and television. Um, this style of mask is called a beauty style mask, and he did some of these for department stores, um, advertising campaigns, cosmetic companies, that kind of thing. Um, and you can see here there's an ad for Macy's showing that they were going to be using uh, masks in their cosmetics department. He also used uh, masks for window displays. Um, Ringling Brothers Circus used some of his masks. Um, Luckily, he wrote a book about mask making and the techniques he used, and that has a very thorough biography and listing of some of the places that the masks appeared in different newspaper publications, magazines like Harper's Bazaar and Cosmopolitan, Look, The New York Times, etc. So in the late um, 1940s, Doan uh, met Carrie Hunt, and this is Carrie here. Um, Carrie was an artist herself and also a mask maker who had, in the early 1940s, really started developing her interest in mask making, um, starting by studying Greek and Roman theater masks. And um, Carrie Carrie's husband, um, Doug Hunt, was an engineer by trade, but also a magician. So Carrie also performed along with him, and she would worked as a dancer on Broadway. Um, so she was a very interesting and talented woman herself. Um, Carrie basically apprenticed with Don Powell um, for a couple of years in the late 1940s. And when he passed away, um, he had wanted her to have the mask collection. So she inherited his entire collection and then started to use it throughout her career. So you can see in this photo, some of the masks, I believe, are Carrie's and some are Dome's. 
And here's Carrie with her daughter Karen with um, a couple of the Down Pal masks. She continued to make her own masks and um, they were used for TV and theater, movies, exhibitions, um, but probably best known in the 1950s for being used in a TV game show called Masquerade Party. And basically in this program a celebrity guest would be dressed either in a mask or heavy makeup and then I understand that a celebrity panel would have to guess who this um, person was by give, giving them certain clues. And so a lot of the Dome Pal masks as well as some masks that Carrie made were used for this TV show. And here are a few more. Carrie passed away in 1999 and her daughter Karen contacted me earlier this year and wondered if we would be interested in the collection of Dome Pal masks. Um, she had actually been doing a little searching online and found a Nebraska Timeline article on our website about Doan, so she knew we had some interest in him already. And she generously donated 69 masks to us. She also sent us wonderful scrapbooks, a huge photo collection showing people wearing the masks, um, showing Doan working in his studio. There's also correspondence and letters um, of all kinds. So. Um, it's a really fantastic collection, and um, our registrar, Christina Smith, has um, just completed cataloging the mask component of the collection. So we have all the masks online. So if, again, if you go to our website, nebraskahistory.org, and then if you go to search collections and photograph and artifact collections, you'll be able to search for Doan Pal there and see all of the masks. Um, we have multiple views of them and uh, thorough descriptions, so you'll be able to see them there if you want some more information. So the next collection I'm going to talk a little bit about is the George Turley Puppet Company. And um, this is another collection we just received this past year. Um, this is a puppet called Jerry the Rat. And um, the George Shirley Pumpet Company was founded in 1973 and then dissolved about 1980. Um, they are probably best known for creating puppets for Calamity Kate's Cartoon Corral. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who were in Lincoln in the late 70s, um, you probably remember this television show that was on a uh, children's television show from 1975 to 1980. Um, George Turley was a writer and producer and puppeteer for the show and created the puppets that you see here, um, many of which have been donated to us. So I thought I'd show you some of the puppets as they are today. This is Deputy Duke and his <coughs> sidekick Stumpy. And um, George said that um, the voice for Deputy Duke was based on an exaggerated John Wayne imita imitation um, and Stumpy's voice was based on Walter Brennan and he described them as the Abbott and Costello of the show. Um, two other characters from the show were um, Harvey and Monica June Cash. Um, Harvey was president of the bank on the show, and Monica, his wife, um, I understand, was very self-centered and always vocal about her dislikes, and therefore a lot of fun for puppeteers to play. Um, little Reggie was their nephew, and um, although he spoke in a childlike fals falsetto, um, George described him as the adult of the puppet cast, and he quickly became one of the favorite characters on the show. Um, in addition um, to the show, um, with the co cooperation of 40 Nebraska schools, George Turley also developed a program um, that was a or, or a game show segment, I should say, featuring fourth, fifth, and sixth grade students called Little Reggie's Quiz Kids. And um, this segment was um, chosen by the National Television Information Office as one of the fine five nationwide examples of excellence in local children's programming. So that was quite a nice honor for them to receive. So in addition to the TV shows, um, they had a, um, a traveling um, group. Um, the puppet company performed 
700 live performances in 16 states and had um, live shows and workshops for kids. This is a character called the Hippie and it was from a show, a touring show called Bits and Puppets. And when it was time for this character to exit, he would say, it's time for me to split. And that's literally what the puppet would do. It has Velcro and it would split apart and exit <laughs> in half. And this is a character called Glorp. Um, George also conducted 42 week-long elementary and high school residencies in Nebraska through the National Endowment for the Arts Artists in Schools program. And he had numerous um, educational workshops and demonstrations that he would do. And Glorp is a character from a, a touring show called Puppets and People. Um, it's actually quite a large puppet, and I haven't shown the legs, but it has um, brightly colored yarn and then uh, feet. Um, so it could kind of make noise on a hard surface and walk around with its feet. Um, George also did a variation of this type of puppet in his workshops for kids. So kids were able to make um, a puppet like this out of a paper plate, um, which they could color, and then um, they had two styrofoam cups uh, connected to yarn to form the feet. So that was something that kids could learn to do and make their own puppet. So a special thanks to George Churley for donating 28 puppets to us. Um, and not only the puppets, but um, he donated scripts from the show, um, video clips, and lots of photographs as well. So in the future we'll have more to show you, I'm, I'm sure. And hopefully exhibition in the future, but this is just your first sneak peek. With that, I will turn it over to Paul. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I want to make a little adjustment here because I'm afraid these speakers are going to are going to blast you out of the room. Let me just go into here and turn these down a little bit. Okay, hopefully that'll work. All right. Um, you know, I'm a lucky guy because I get to work with one of the best audiovisual collections you'll find in any state. I always enjoy the opportunity to mine some of the, of the nuggets from the stacks and show them to uh, the public. And although our holdings go back to 1900, I've picked some uh, post-World War II gems for you today, and I'll be showing them roughly in chronological order. Uh, the first is a segment from This Is Our Town, Syracuse. Uh, this film was made in 1953 as a prolonged advertisement for the, sound of, uh, the town of Syracuse, Nebraska. These kinds of films were not uncommon at the time. Uh, World War II had produced, uh, trained countless movie cameramen, and after the war they wanted to ply their trade. Now, a lot of them ended up in the new industry of television, but others, like Robert Carson, who made this film, became filmmakers for hire, not unlike the itinerant uh, photographers from decades before that went around and took pictures of kids in uh, goat carts and that sort of thing. Um, so the late 40s and the early 50s were really the heyday of the sponsored film. Now this film was probably sponsored by the uh, Syracuse Chamber of Commerce. It showcases a landscape and lifestyle now long gone. And in hindsight, it's not without its unintentional humor, as you'll see from this clip. And here it is. This is our town, Syracuse. Let's look in as the Syracuse Sausage Company makes wainers. Step number one is the grinding of grade A beef cheeks. The cheeks, carefully inspected before being passed for Syracuse sausage, are fed to this grinder which grinds the beef into the first rough stock. 
In the mixer, step number two, spices and seasoning are added to the rough wiener stock. The formula is a Syracuse sausage secret. The rough stock and seasoning are found in a well-mixed formula. And then to the chopper. This machine beats the wiener stock into a smooth batter substance. The batter is easiest to handle when ready to insert into the skins on the supper. Each process is carefully timed and cataloged. The wiener batter is taken to the supper, and here gut skins are filled with the batter, and the wiener begins to take rough shape. It is United States government inspected. When filled, the skins are passed to the twisters who twist individual wieners. This is an art in itself and takes a little while to learn. And then to the smokehouse for that final touch of flavoring. Here, smoking is a day's production of the old-fashioned Bologna, a Syracuse sausage specialty. Controlled smoking and seasoning processes make Syracuse sausage one of the most popular sausage names in the country. And to the cooler after smoking goes the day's production. Here the trucks will gather the day's output of smooth, mouth-watering sausage delight. The trucks will pick up their day's consignment here and will move from town to town with goodwill <coughs> and good Syracuse sausage. Now imagine about, oh, 20 minutes more of that kind of thing about Syracuse and you, you have the whole film, which uh, I'd be glad to show you. Uh, if you get in touch with me at the, the archives. Okay, jump ahead now to the early 1960s. I mentioned television. Uh, TV came to Nebraska in, in the late 1940s, 1949, uh, in Omaha with WWT and KMTV. In Lincoln, it was a bit later, 1953. Uh, with KOLN and KFOR TV, but that's another story for another time. Uh, now, unless you've been off the planet for the last month or so, uh, you've seen TV file footage from November 1963, that dark time of a president's assassination, uh, the 50th anniversary which we have just commemorated. Um, this was the first such event in which television played a major role, and this no doubt added to the public's emotion. Uh, Lincoln had its reaction like any, any other place, and here are some clips from KOLN's file footage. I would like on this occasion to read a proclamation which I have issued within the last 15 minutes. Whereas our nation and the world has suffered a staggering loss in the tragic and untimely death of our beloved President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and whereas it is proper that we respectfully and solemnly observe a period of mourning. Now therefore I, Frank B. Morrison, Governor of the State of Nebraska, do hereby proclaim a period of mourning in the State of Nebraska for 30 days and ask that the flag of the United States be flown at half mass from sunrise to sunset from this day on for a 30 day period. Witness whereof have hereunto set my hand caused the great seal of the state of Nebraska to be affixed, done at the state capital of Lincoln, this 22nd day of November, in the year of our Lord, 1963. These are also some scenes from the day of the funeral uh, when uh, stores were closed uh, just for part of the day.
The reaction to the death of the president here in the capital city, the city of Lincoln, has been pure and simple shock. Of course, with the cold here this afternoon, people are scurrying about on the streets, attempting to get out of the brisk wind, bringing cold temperatures. But the reaction has been pure shock. Ma'am, would you make any comment about the president? Oh, I think I'm probably as stunned as everybody and a little bit sick. Thank you. Pardon me, ma'am. Ma I'd like to ask your reaction to the death of the president. Well, I, anything like that is a terrible uh, tragedy to a nation. Whether you are for him or against him makes no difference. That's not the way to answer the question. Thank you. Would you comment on the death of the president? Oh, it's a very sad thing indeed. I am a Republican, but I couldn't feel more distressed over this serious out uh, situation. It's a dreadful thing. You comment on the death of the president? I didn't know we had such maniacs in the world that would do something like that. I, I was shocked. I don't know how anybody could do anything like that. Of course, uh, it's just one of those things, and I believe in faith, and when our number's up, we're gone. Now we skip ahead to uh, this time to 1967. Now, this was a big year for. Uh, local filmmaking in Nebraska. Uh, can anyone tell me why, what else was happening in 1967 in Nebraska? Centennial. The centennial, that's right. So a lot of uh, promotional filmmaking was going on. Many organizations and interest groups produced films to celebrate the state's history and, of course, their role in it. Um, some of the films we have in this genre are Nebraska Land of Grass, uh, produced by the, uh, by the Nebraska Grass Council, and a film with one of my favorite titles, Mixing Brains with Ink, uh, produced by the State Board of Education. But in a move looking more forward uh, into the future rather than the past, the Lincoln Chamber of Commerce produced a film, a uh, promotional film, like Our Town Syracuse. There's, there are no wieners in this one, by the way. Uh, it makes Lincoln look out to be, you know, a happening town, the place to be, uh, modern and cosmopolitan in every way. Um, I have segments here from the film's beginning and the end, but before I show it, I want to mention uh, the color of the film and the scratches. Uh, film is subject to damage and deterioration, and these are obvious signs of it. Uh, in an archives, we do what we can to preserve, but uh, we also take what we can get. And this film was obviously used a lot and probably endured poor storage conditions, but it's the only copy that we've been able to uncover. Well, enough about that. Here's Serenade to a City.
like uh, <clears throat> Bond, James Bond in Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, okay, we thought we'd end with something to help us get into the holiday spirit. Um, it's also a chance for me to showcase one of my favorite film genres, and that's home movies. Forrest Rakes was a John Deere implement dealer in Ashland, Nebraska. He was also an avid photographer and home movie maker. Uh, what's especially good about his home movies is his consistency over time. He shot every Christmas as his kids, his nieces and nephews, his grandkids were all growing up. I've edited together a montage of Christmas scenes stretching from 1941 through 1970. That's 30 years of Christmases. What's really cool is to see the toys that were probably uh, part of some of our own lives. Oh, and I, I should mention too that the music and the titles like that I added later. The original film is silent. And that's all I have to share. Uh, happy holidays and thanks for coming.
Do you have any questions for for us individually or collectively? Comments? Yes. Do you know is that the same Riggs family that Senator Riggs is from and his brother? I don't know, okay. actually. No. I, I, I'll find that out, though. That that'd be good to know. Yeah. You asked about the. Uh, we might remind us of toys that we have. Mm -hmm. In 5253, where it was, they showed, showed a dollhouse. Mm -hmm. I think we have equipped that same dollhouse or, you know, a model of it in our basement right now. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you. Let's hope it's not rusted. Because most of, most of those I've seen have been rusted. Uh, but, yeah, that's, that uh, was familiar to me as well. Any other comments? Questions? All right, thanks again.